not come to wage the strife. With swords upon this hill, it is not wise to waste a life against a stubborn will. But yet, would we die? Friends, the music you've just heard, created and sung by Mr. James Tokley, a student in the audience, was inspired by the poem, The Daybreakers, written by the celebrated Arna Bontemps. At the end of the program, you will hear Mr. Tokley's musical adaptation of Close Your Eyes, another Bontemps poem. Before we meet Mr. Bontemps, I have the pleasure of introducing guests who will participate in the discussion. Seated beside me is Mrs. Marjorie Farmer, who will help direct the discussion. She is the head of the English department of the Philadelphia School District. In the front row, Ms. Helen May Mullen, assistant coordinator, Office of Work with Children, Philadelphia Free Library. Dr. Mary Elizabeth Coleman, Vice Dean, Graduate School of Education, University of Pennsylvania. Mrs. Trudy Barnes, Office of Intergroup Relations, Philadelphia School District. Mrs. Priscilla Holton, Private School Teacher. And two doctoral students, Mr. Charles Allen and Mrs. Dory Phipps. These students, as well as most of the others in the audience, are connected with Triple T, Trainers of Teacher Trainers, an urban-oriented doctoral program. I'm going to break the ice with several comments and questions before calling on guests to ask questions. Mr. Bontemps, you were writing and compiling primarily black folk tales, poetry, plays, biographies, and fiction. Back in the 1930s you began long before publishing channels were generally open for blacks. Can you tell us some of the obstacles you overcame to first publish, and who helped you? Well, if you uh, are referring to the first book publication, the answers would be of one kind, but you might also have in mind publications in which my writings appeared prior to uh, their first appearance in books. Uh, I was writing poetry and publishing it since 1924. The first one to be accepted by a national magazine was in August of that year. And then the, uh, the poem that you, you've just heard, Set to Music, The Daybreakers, was published in the spring or winter of 1925 so that, um, uh, well, I would think of these publications and perhaps uh, a couple of dozen others together with several literary prizes, which uh, 
which happened to come my way during the late 20s, I would look upon these as being the opening wedge. It was these things that made possible the first book. And I would therefore suggest to anybody who might be here who's looking forward to publication of a book, a good way to break the ice, uh, to use your phrase, is to, uh, is to try uh, to offer pub their works, their writings, in smaller uh, dimensions in to uh, periodicals, magazines. I've just seen uh, the newspaper for this, the campus of this university as I came into the room. The, uh, that's a good outlet. And it's, it would seem to me that from my experience, it would take about just a little less than 10 years of that sort of exploration to be ready for the first book. I didn't have to have any individual help after I had appeared in say, uh, uh, more than a dozen magazines and uh, had won, say, three or four prizes, literary prizes, uh, to helped. introduce me. All I had to do was send the manuscript in, and if, they, if the, the editor asked something about my background, I would then very modestly tell him that I just won a few prizes. <laughs> Without benefit of agent, is Without that right? benefit of agents. No agents that far, because agents, you know, are harder to get, good agents, than publishers. <laughs> you can, there are a lot of people uh, standing around who would like to be the, your agent, but they will charge you money. Whereas the, the only kind of agent that is worth anything to you is the one who will pay you money. <laughs> Unless the agent promises to pay you for reading his for reading your manuscript, forget him. He's you you did not really need the help of someone else to get published, but haven't you helped some others to enter the publishing field? Well, occasionally I, I think I have tried to help, and one or two people have said that I did. Uh, the most recent thing I did was not it was not to get a. Uh, a new writer in the field what is, was to bring back uh, the, the writings of, a, of an earlier writer. Earlier, uh, well, one who started out a good bit before I did. And I'm uh, thinking now of Gene Toomer, whose book, Cain, is now uh, in most uh, English courses, most, English, most colleges that I've visited such as Yale and uh, Syracuse. Well, just I suppose nearly all of them are using, making it required reading. Uh, it was out of print, you know, had been for, for more than 35 years. And I got interested in it and began to uh, campaign on my own to bring it back. And eventually it, it came. And your preface, your and, introduction And of course, when it, when it did come, then they asked me to do the introduction to it. Uh, which I did, which you may have seen. Prior to that, I had, uh, I had uh, given speeches. I had uh, written an essay, which appeared in a book called Anger and Beyond, a collection of essays collected by Herbert Hill. This had been a speech that I made at the University of California, Berkeley, and uh, he asked to include it in this book. Well, now that was, of course, breaking the ground a little bit. I think maybe I'm answering your first question a little bit. Uh, this business of breaking the yes. ground, you, you just don't get into publishing coal. You have to take it by steps. Yes, you've told me. Patience. All right. <laughs> that's, the greatest, uh, uh, that's the greatest attribute you can have. That's even greater than talent. I'll <laughs> <laughs> come in handy. Uh, a lot of people have talent, but few, only a few have patience. I want to tell you that one of your poems that's my favorite is A Black Man Talks of Reaping. I think we in the audience would appreciate if you would read it to us. Well, it's a pleasure. Um, Tell us when you wrote it. This was written in the 20s also, uh, a little after the two th th that I uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, and it, it appeared, I'm trying to think where it appeared. 
Uh, it appeared in one of the New York magazines, but I've really forgotten just which one. But uh, I got paid for it, uh, I, although I probably got less than $10. I thought that was big money then. But nowadays, whenever it reappears in one of your school books, as it frequently does, I generally get about 35 or $40 just for the reprint of it. So that shows you what the, what, what, the what, market. what time does for you and the market. <laughs> If you just uh, are, you know, if you, if you just keep well and stay around. <laughs> I have sown beside all waters in my day. I planted deep within my heart the fear that m wind or fowl would take the grain away. I planted safe against this stark, lean year. I scattered seed enough to plant the land in rows from Canada to Mexico, but for my reaping, only what the hand can hold at once is all that I can show. Yet, what I sowed and what the orchard yields, my brother's sons are gathering stalk and root. Small wonder then, my children Glean in fields they have not sown, and feed on bitter fruit. That was beautifully done. Tell Thank me you. something. Mm -hmm. How can you, with your experiences as a black man, use the word brother in the last verse when many others today cannot? Well, <laughs> I must tell you that when I wrote it, I didn't. It didn't have. I didn't have to think twice. It was just right on the in the front of my uh, consciousness. But uh, these are our brothers. We're all Americans. Some Americans are, uh, uh, enjoy advantages that others don't. And as a matter of fact, this poem was written during the period known as the Renaissance, the Harlem Renaissance. And uh, something had happened there that, uh, that I think uh, was probably it was in, in, in my consciousness, even though I hadn't uh, reduced it to its simplest terms. In the early phases of the Renaissance, people like Jean Toomer and uh, Count A. Cullen and Langston Hughes and Claude McKay wrote things which were, uh, which were hailed as the beginning of a Renaissance, of a new awakening, black awakening. Uh, not many people noticed them. But among those who did were a number, well, uh, the, the first of those who did notice were, were other writers, white writers, uh, who, who saw that here was something that was genuine and real and that was coming uh, to life. And it was a pity that, as they felt, that somebody with know-how and with contacts and with experience in writing shouldn't pick up some of that rich new material and, make, uh, and present it to the, the wider audience. And so there was a, a very frequent tendency for them to pick up something that they had ca uh, caught in Harlem and, and uh, present it in their own style and in their own works. And an, an illustration of this might be George Gershwin, who came to Harlem to hear the new beat, hear, the, hear Jelly Roll Morton and W.C. Handy, and Bessie Smith and the rest, and what did he do? He went back home and wrote Rhapsody in Blue. And uh, pretty soon, Paul Whiteman played it. So the next thing you knew, it was all over. Well, now, the first big th thought that's, that, that some of us had, that some, that some I, I heard some express, was here, these people come down here and pick up the thing they heard us playing in a jazz, in a jam session, take it down there and make a million dollars. And here, we, what do we get? Almost nothing. Handy, for example, had sold his uh, 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 Memphis Blues for $50. And somebody picked it up and took it down there. He didn't know it was valuable at that point and made a, a fortune from it. Uh, fortunately, I later wrote Handy's autobiography for him. So I learned the inside of it. Fortunately, after he had been uh, sort of gypped out of that first one, he came back with another the St. Louis Blues, and he didn't let that one get away. And so he, uh, he lived very solvently for the rest of his life uh, as a result. 
So I think it was, it's this idea that, uh, that, the ex, that, uh, that, that the young creative people had of having their stuff picked up by those with greater, with contacts with the publishers and reputations. Another illustration I could give you is uh, Carl Van Vechten, who was sort of accused of corrupting the Renaissance. It wasn't that at all. He, he, and I think he wasn't really trying to make money, but he, uh, he was anxious to have the, the word passed along. So he came there and picked up things and went down and wrote a novel, which became the big bestseller of that decade. Uh, but uh, he had, the, the reason he could do it was partly because he, he uh, had experienced writing, more experience, partly because he had contacts, and partly because he had had two bestsellers already. And this gave him a strong platform, a strong basis for, 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 for getting away with it. So that when his novel came out, it did 50 times better than anything that had been done by the black writers ever. No bookseller would, was interested and so forth. Uh, no, they were reluctant to pick it up, but here's a man with, uh, with an established a star, and uh, a, a book announced by him would, would naturally have a great, uh, great impact. So I'm said here that what my brother's sons are getting rich off it, so naturally I shouldn't complain if my, if my uh, children go out and, and do things. With uh, bitter fruit. Uh, with bitter fruit, right. And, and do things in a bitter, a bitter mood. Your turn, Mrs. Farmer. Well, we move beyond anger, and we move beyond the bitter fruit, and I'm very conscious of this in works of yours that I read. Even in uh, such a sad, deeply sad story as the short story, A Summer Tragedy, you know, which goes very deeply into the special kind of pathos, the special kind of anguish of part of the black experience. But there is also, and as you speak of uh, uh, the Harlem Renaissance, and as you speak of the experiences in this poem, there's also a sense of a special joy and special qualities of, of beauty and power in the life that you describe. You want to say something about, about this? Well, you, you, you touched me at a very sensitive and very uh, uh, po po point where you, when you mentioned a summer tragedy, because it represented a very crucial point in my own experience. It was written just after the close of the Harlem Renaissance, uh, when, when things were very, uh, very, very dim and for me, and as well as for many of the other writers. You know that the Harlem Renaissance ended in 1931. It ended uh, after the stock market crash of 1929. And the, uh, but the effects of it reached Harlem in, by the first part of 1931. And all the young writers and composers and artists were scattered because they, their employment was very, uh, uh, it was built on sand, to say the least. And so they began to try to find places to land what they, when they were scattered by this great disaster of the Depression. Uh, and I, I found a little job. I, I was one of them. And I found a little job in northern Alabama teaching. While down there, of course, uh, uh, remembering the uh, Renaissance period and the great exuberance which had filled the air during that period, and looking around at the, the suffering from the Depression. And on the top of that, uh, be, be, being very close to the, the location of a great tragedy called the Scottsboro case, yeah. which, had, which, which occurred just a few miles from where I was working. And the trial occurred very, it was very nearby. All of this was happening in the fall of 31. Now you see now in the spring of 31, I'd had my first novel published and I had been walking on a cloud because uh, that's something I had been working toward for nearly a decade. Uh, but it all came down with a thud. So I finally saw this little story. I saw a little notice in the paper, in uh, the newspaper of a couple, an old couple, that had uh, 
done what they do in that story, I won't tell the answer to the, the ending of it because it's an unexpected ending. Yes. Uh, they had done, this little couple had done that, so mulling over it, I told the whole story. And I, by the way, I sent it to a contest. Uh, and it won a prize. Such a sense of the tremendous dignity mm, of uh, little poor people. Poor people, in story. right. Yes. Well, thank you. I, I could tell you that one reason that I feel sentimental about it is because it now appears in some 20 odd books. I think it does. Uh, so I, that's what I like to see. Uh. Miss Mullen. Well, I, I think you write such fascinating introductions to whatever uh, type of book you're writing the introduction for. And we get glimpses of what must be a fascinating life you've had. And I was just wondering if there's going to be an autobiography someday. Well, you, you, you guessed right. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I'm, I'm trying to write it now. Very good. But I have enjoyed writing um, introductions because I've been interested in literature as such. I've been interested in black literature in a special way when I've had an opportunity to do something that would uh, help to call it to the attention of the public. I have always been very willing to do it. And I've, I suppose I have woven a good bit of autobiography in each of those uh, introductions. Uh, and since the publishers didn't complain, I let it let it go. Never enough, though. You just get just a hint well, of what might have been. <laughs> well, I do intend to uh, write uh, to complete my autobiography. I've started it. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Barnes. Well, really, I'm so fascinated by just being in the company of a man I haven't seen since I was about eight years old. <laughs> but I'm, I, I think the richness of this communication so overwhelms me. There's nothing I want to ask him. I just want to be enriched. <laughs> by being in the Fine. Many of us feel that way. Mrs. Holton, do you wish to? Well, I certainly yeah. share the same sentiments of uh, Mrs. Barnes. I have really been a lover of your works for years, and I, I can very proudly say that my three children grew up uh, with a great many of your uh, pieces of literature. But I was reading something the other day uh, by this, well, he's not a new author, uh, Ellison, I think, who wrote The Invisible Man. There was an interview in Atlantic magazine, and I was a little interested in some of the statements that he makes, and I wondered, uh, what you think of his statement that uh, he doesn't write from a black culture, but from an American culture. Uh, this kind of, <laughs> I wondered about that because uh, I, I, as you, you, your opening statement was that we are Americans, true, but I, I just feel that as black people we have a, a rich heritage and we do have a culture, and it's hard for me to think of a writer of of this prominence, you know, making this statement, and I do know that his appearance on many of the campuses has been in an uproar. <laughs> Just to turn things upside down. Yes, that's that's very true. I know Ralph; uh, he's a friend of mine. Yeah. Uh, but that, uh, uh, well, th this is one reason why I have uh, some complaints against uh, literary criticism in general, this splitting of hairs. Mm -hmm. I really think that we are, that uh, what happens here is that, uh, that, that words are used in one way by one person and another way by another, but they both really uh, have, have in mind the same general truth, but they put it in different ways. And I'm afraid that that was what it is. Now, I, I believe that we write, we all, we're, we're all uh, Americans. And I and and I would uh, you know I would contend with anybody who tried to dispute it, uh, uh, but I also know that we have uh, we have a culture that has come out of our group within the culture, uh, and that uh, that uh, it hasn't all stayed here. It has permeated the whole American culture, um, so that uh, that whenever anybody dances, let us say. He's, uh, he starts do, using some of our culture right away, because if you take our music out of it, if you took our, our, our steps out, you know, it w wouldn't be the same dance before, before we'd start messing up with it. It wasn't that. So we, we fixed it so that, 
that it's that 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 it's really uh, not not being true to the facts if you 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 pretend that uh, there's a that, that there is an American culture without us. There isn't. We are we are the Amer we are a very s significant part of the American culture. So I I I question that the the, the uh, some of that terminology. In yes. concluding part one of Meet Arna Bontoms, we pay tribute to the author who in 1956 won the Jane Addams Children's Book Award for the story of the Negro, the man who co-authored with Langston Hughes, or co-compiled, the monumental book of Negro folklore, two-time winner of the Julius Rosenwald Fellowship, and Guggenheim Fellowship winner for research on the lives of W.E.B. Du Bois, Frederick Douglass, and Booker T. Washington. Mr. Bontemps' life work has revolved around books, not only as an author, but also as a librarian. After many years as head librarian at Fisk University, he is now curator of the James Weldon Johnson Collection at Yale University Library. Thank you very much, Mr. Bontemps. With closed eyes Stand direct and let your black face front the west Drop the axe And leave the timber where it lies A woman on the hill Must have his rest Come to wage a strife with swords upon this hill. It is not wise to waste a life against a stubborn will.